Marv, you attended the Los Angeles Art Center College of Design, which is best known for automotive design. Wasn't that an unusual school for someone interested in animation? Well, they, they call it the Nazi training camp of art. <laughs> but um, uh, yes, yeah, I actually made the first animated film that was ever made at that school. So. Well, did you see yourself as an innovator or some sort of renegade? No, I felt like a desperate person because <laughs> I uh, was trying to make live movies. Ah. And uh, I made a couple, and then I tried to finish this live picture so I could graduate, and I needed a stop-action sunrise and couldn't get it because um, of the weather, the weather too many clouds. <clears throat> so I had an idea for a little movie, and I could always draw pictures. And I sort of knew what animation, how it worked, kind of, and um, set up the whole thing on a drawing table with a... Uh, hand crank, 30 second crank, uh, 16 millimeter Bolex camera on a tripod pointed at this thing and that's how I shot it. It's, I mean, if you could do an animated film more wrong than I did that picture, you, you wouldn't have a picture. I mean. Bambi Meets Godzilla has become an underground classic. I mean, I must have heard about it from 10 people before I actually even saw the film. Why has it become almost this icon? Um, I'd like to think it's the idea, but I think it's such a dumb, one-joke idea. I can't believe it's popular. There's something else going on that I don't understand, definitely. That was your first film. One of your latest films is Black Hula. What inspired you to make this surrealistic little postcard? Uh, the, the music. That's the, the song I love. And uh, I thought I, I, I must do something with this song sometime. And um, so I decided, well, I'm going to make a movie to this song. I can make it. I wanna, I've always wanted to make a movie as fast as I could go. Because most of what we do, we, we're so careful rendering everything. So it's full animation. It's Disney style. And this thing, I wanted it to be kind of prim primitive and crude. I also liked it because the song was in Hawaiian, which is an obscure language. When you go out in the festival circuits, or you, even in Canada, where there's always language problems and so on, I thought it would be great to do a film where the language was completely different. And no one could complain about it whether it's English or French or what the heck it is. It's this obscure language. So all those things, really the words don't mean a darn thing. I mean, no one understands what's being said, but they still understand the film. I mean, so the language becomes just another instrument in the song. Nakama. Black Hula a dozen times and I always find more and more meaning in it. I mean what you have going on in the background and, and the things the three guys are holding up. It's a really powerful political statement. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. I don't, I mean, I just think it's a, it's sort of a, it's stating uh, the obvious. Uh, you know, you have politics and it goes on and it seems so important, but that's only on the surface of the planet. You know, down inside there are there are forces so far greater, and who knows what's outside. And uh, it seems like we're so narrow-minded to be, a, and we're a rock in space. That's all we are. And um, we should be thinking more about that than about our little tiny
tiny problems and so on, it seems to me. Now, I heard at one screening of Black Hula, someone actually jumped up and called the film racist. Uh, pardon me, isn't this a statement against racism? That was the intention. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, just aghast when someone leaped up and said it was racist. And I said, please, I, I don't even know how to answer you. Come and talk to me and, and tell me what you think's wrong. And they said, well, there are big lips on this character. And I said, well, what's racist about big lips? There are big lips on the goat and the dinosaur. And a lot of the characters in this have big lips. It's just a design thing. It, it doesn't mean anything. It's not like, I don't know what, what, you, what you're saying, you know? So it's weird. <laughs> you formed an animation company, International Rocket Ship Limited. Love the name. You're acting as a producer to a whole group of young animators. I hear they call you the chieftain. Tell me about your company's most infamous project, Lupo the Butcher. Danny Antonucci's the director, and he conceived it and brought the storyboard to me. Um, when I saw that, I knew we had to make it. It was, you know, racist, it was violent, and it was senseless. So those three elements, I think, were uh, key to the success of the picture. Hey! Hey! Well, it was too much for Nancy. Are people upset by Lupo? The um, lack of complaint is enormous on that picture. We, I mean, the picture is shown in Italy on Italian television. And most people would say it's a defamation of Italian Americans or Italian Canadians because it's based on a, an uncle of Danny's from Toronto. We've had people complain a little bit. One person walked out of a theater in Vancouver, but I mean, 999 people stayed. So now, I mean, it's a, it's a classic, it's a cult film, uh, and uh, enormous, enormously popular. And he's working on another picture where we, everybody in the family is uh, going to be introduced, and it's called Meet the Family. <laughs> it's great, I'm looking forward to it. How do you bring these mad scribblings to life and imbue them with such personality? I, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I don't know, to tell you the truth. I, I, uh, I mean, Danny's character, Lupo, is really a character. Um, I've had characters in some of my films, but my pictures, my personal pictures, really aren't character focused. They, the, there's a character, but it's more the whole picture is what <clears throat> is, uh, the intention is to convey a whole world instead of just a character. And I've often thought about that. I think maybe I would have to tone things or, you know, concentrate on character instead of picture, but I don't know if that's my natural inclination or not. And I think that if you're doing something, you should follow your natural instincts, and that's when you have the best results.